So our next speaker is Joe Elkington, who's a professor of entomology in the Department of Environmental Conservation here at UMass. And he's going to talk to us about the climate change effects on invasive forest insects. So I've worked my entire career on various species of forest insects, gypsy moth. We just had a big, huge gypsy moth event that many of you have seen. I don't even talk about gypsy moth today, but I'll leave that to Valerie later on today. But at any rate, um, no question that um, um, climate change has had a big impact on many species. We heard a little bit about, we heard a nice presentation about the southern pine beetle moving north last, last year by Bradley Horton. Um, but um, there's some more, even more spectacular stories from the western United States that uh, Bethany touched on, which I'm going to start with. But I'm going to also talk about the work I'm doing on winter moth and, and hemlock woolly adelgid. All of these species are affected by climate change in various ways. Uh, we learned that there's rain shifts going north, so the northern limit of many of these species is going north, like it is for many plant species. In some cases, uh, um, this also happens at higher altitude. Mountain pine beetle will look going to higher altitude. There are high temperature effects. I'm not even going to talk about this today. I, I can only talk about it so much. Uh, but uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, for example, is a major uh, killer of hemlock trees in our area. In Georgia, work by Angelo Mech shows that, that the hemlock trees are protected because the high temperatures kill the adelgids. And we've, we've shown that in the experimental work in our, right here in Amherst, high temperatures kill the adelgids. So this insect is, is infected at both ends of the spectrum. Gypsy moth. Has stopped spreading south. I'm not going to talk about gypsy moth today, but there's really cool work, interesting work showing that gypsy moth is still spreading across the Midwest and into the south, but in Virginia it has stopped because of warmer temperatures. So it, for the first time in 134 years, gypsy moth is actually starting to move north again. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I'm going to touch. I'm going to end on the effect of temperature variability because that's a subtle concept that I I want to talk about. I'll work on adelgid. Okay, we heard we saw him talk yesterday about how uh, uh, temperature um, temperature extremes are changing, and we saw that. Remember that that bell curve, bell shaped curve that that Rabbit presented yesterday of temperatures, and how um, this is this is it's moving this direction, so you get more hot events and fewer cold events. Well, there's an alternate idea out there embodied in this slide, which uh, suggests, and Bradley mentioned this yesterday. Uh, that actually you have more temperature extremes that has to do with the, the, the jet stream, amplitude of the jet stream, uh, 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 the, the jet streams that are moving north and south. So we're going from a world that um, looks like this to a world like this. So at our region, we're getting both hot and cold. We have more extremes, but maybe more and more cold events as well as hot events. I don't know which one of these models is true, but uh, in either case, we're, we're facing a lot of variability, and that has huge effects, which I will talk about. Okay, well, the biggest, by far the most spectacular examples of climate change in forest insect are bark beetles. And we heard one story yesterday about southern pine beetle, but even more uh, dramatic stories occur in the western United States. And the whole thing is, um, it's important to understand that bark beetles, the bark beetles that we're dealing with, the dendroxus bark beetles, like the southern pine beetle, um, are tree-killing beetles. They have to kill the tree in order for the brood to survive. So in, 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 at low density, they limp along on, on trees that have been struck by lightning. You know, they kill a tree here and there. But they, they, they institute them, what's called the mass attack. So a few beetles will land on the tree, born to the tree. The tree responds by exuding resin, as shown here. And if, if there's only a few beetles, the tree will win. And they'll drown the beetles in resin, and the attack will fail. And the, and the, but the, the beetles re release what's called an attack pheromone. They attract other beetles of both sexes by the thousands onto the tree. And so you get this massive attack. The tree is riddled with, with, with attacks. And, under the, and if enough beetles land, they've killed the tree. Under the right conditions, a few trees will, explode, it will blow up into a massive outbreak. So you have so many beetles, but it's a, it's a mass phenomenon. So it really only occurs where in stands which are completely dominated by the available host trees. So I'm not so worried about the southern pine beetle, but most of New England. In pitch, uh, pitch pine stands at Cape Cod and Long Island, yes, perfect setting because we're dominated by pitch pine. Here in the rest of New England, we have a, a, you know, red pines or white pines. I'm not sure they're even susceptible. Going here and there, I don't think we're going to see a lot of mortality, even though the bus beetle may be established. Anyways, in the West, very spectacular outbreaks have occurred for generations associated with drought. When you have drought conditions, that's what triggers a park beetle outbreak. So all those orange trees up there are dead trees that have been killed by the mountain pine beetle. 
And this is the one that's most spectacular because it has, and Bethany touched on this yesterday, it's been moving north. In British Columbia, the green is, is showing where the pines grow. It's mostly lodgepole pine up there. And uh, it was too cold for, for mountain pine beetle to cause mortality until recently, in the last few decades. So the bark beetle has moved north and caused unbelievably spectacular, unbelievably, all those trees are dead. We had unbelievable, over vast square miles of, of forest. And you know, I'm just reading the news about forest fires in British Columbia. You know, a, tr a stand like that is just set for forest birth. So it's an unbelievably spectacular widespread event caused by climate change and the northward range movement. A similar thing is happening at higher altitude. So uh, mountain pine beetle normally attacks the lodgepole pine and the, and the uh, ponderosa pine growing here at lower elevation. There's a whole suite of high altitude pine trees, foxtail pine, um, colimbra pine, bristle cone pine, and uh, white bark pine that are were immune to bark beetle outbreaks until recently because they moved up in higher altitudes. So this slide here shows a vast stand at highest altitude of white bark pine. Now that's an ecological disaster because this tree produces uh, uh, nuts that are dependent upon by things like nut, nut, nutcracker, cross nutcracker, grizzly bears. There's a whole suite of organisms that depend upon nuts of these trees at high altitude. And when you get a, a complete stand wipeout like that, it has ecosystem level effects. There's a lot of very spectacular events like this going on in the Western United States. Other species I'll just mention, spruce beetle is attacked. This is not a pine killing, it's a spruce attacking beetle, and it occurs all across the boreal forest. So you have, these, again, you know, all those trees are dead. That's Alaska. And this has to do with the increase in, uh, as I understand it, season, the increase in the length of the growing season. We heard about that yesterday as well. So there, there's more generations per year of the spruce beetle, and you get these massive die-offs like that. So bark beetles are a very um, spectacular insects, and luckily here in New England, we're, we're mostly immune, except perhaps in, on Cape Cod, where we have uh, time-dominated stands. Okay, well, most of my work, I used to work on bark beetles from my PhD, but most of my work in recent years have been involved with the, with the uh, chip winter moth, which is a new, brand new invader. It's a little green inch one caterpillar. Best to show a picture of it yesterday. Um, the winter moth uh, outbreak began in 2003. We heard, started hearing about defoliation north and south of Boston by a little green inch one. We have native species like the fall canker worm that, that does this. Um, so that's what we assumed it was. You know, the fall canker worm outbreaks happen and then they go away. This one persisted. And then we heard about flights at Christmas time. Christmas time? Uh, no, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and people like my sister who lives outside of Boston, there's hundreds of moths flying at our window. That's, there's no native insect does that. Winter moth. Winter moth is called winter moth. It's a European insect, and it uh, flies in the wintertime. So, a new invasion. Well, I jumped on this project because this actually, it, we knew about, there was, a, there was an infestation in Nova Scotia that was solved by a biocontrol introduction, which we are in the process of doing right here in Massachusetts. That's another story. I, don't, I won't talk about that but there's a climate change link to this. So it's a defoliator. It's, it's a very prolific. It's like gypsy moth, more prolific as gypsy moth. It loves maple trees, loves oak trees, apple trees. The blueberry cop has been completely obliterated in, in East Massachusetts and Rhode Island because of this insect. So it's a huge problem in people's yards. Basically the life cycle, it's, it's, a, it's an H1 caterpillar that hatches it just a, a, a bud burst. Uh, it feeds in May. In the middle of May, it's done. It drops to the ground, pupates in the soil, and then the adults emerge in November and December, as I was saying. So that's the female. She has no wings. She puts all her energy into egg production. And the males do the flying, and then they, and she introduces the pheromone and attracts the males, and then she lays eggs on the box of fish. The egg is the overwintering stage. So first thing we did, well, as entomologists, we have pheromones for all of these things. That's this work was done through the 1970s. We've identified the pheromone of, of winter moth. So we can put them in pheromone traps, and we can attract them. I home this sticky trap myself uh, in, in, down in the east, southeast, you see all those, all those moths. I mean, there's thousands of moths come flying in, uh, um, and you know, within about 15 minutes, the whole trap is full of, 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 female, of male winter moths. We now use these large capacity traps. We can catch more of them. And anyway, but the, the problem is we have a native species called the Bruce Stanworm. It uses the same pheromone. So we, Everywhere where we hang these traps, all across North America, 
at least northern the northern states, we catch both, we catch spruce sandworm. It's out there, it's a non-pest species, but it fills up our traps. So we're doing, a, you know, it's very interesting to compare the ecology of these two species, but, and they're very hard to tell apart, unfortunately. So, you know, there are minor differences in the wind coloration, but they're not reliable. We're using DNA to tell them apart, so that's a different story. Anyway, this shows the result. We, we deployed these traps all over New England. The green traps are Bruce Stanmore. I'm going to curve everywhere. The, the red traps are the winter moth. So we showed where the winter moth infestation was. So the winter moth infestation extended from Long Island all across eastern New England up into Nova Scotia. Now, when we knew about Nova Scotia, that, that got winter moth back in the 1930s, as I mentioned before. We also discovered winter moth right along the coast of Maine, right there along the coast. Our colleagues in Maine never heard of winter moth. There's never been a winter moth problem or anything. Um, um, but it was there. And uh, well, we noticed immediately there's, there's a link. Look at the maritime distribution. There's a link to, to cold hardiness zone maps. This is the plant hardiness zone maps that people use to, to determine what they can plant where. So it's, it's all based on minimum winter temperature. So the light green, I was very surprised to learn that Nova Scotia has very similar winter temperatures to, to us. Uh, and that's because Nova Scotia is sitting out there on the Gulf Stream, and uh, so the temperatures in Nova Scotia are very similar to us. And as you can see, right along the coast of Maine, there's this little fan of warm temperatures. And we heard uh, yesterday about warming of the, of, uh, of the ocean in this region, and this is, this is part, of the pro part of the process. So you can see the winter moth has gotten, now it's gotten a foothold in eastern Massachusetts. It's likely to spread across the United States and become the next gypsy moth. So we're working hard to prevent that. At any rate, so um, so the winter moth is a coastal distribution, which is almost certainly related to minimum winter temperatures. What is the mechanism? So, well, one thing we know is this is the old zone. The old zone map. This is this is the old uh, um, plant zone map. They now have a new sign map, and those green areas are moving up inland and further north. So, and indeed, just in the last. In 2012, suddenly there was an eruption of winter moth all along the coast of Maine. They'd never had winter moth before. I mean, it was there, but it, it exploded into an outbreak, den outbreak density all along the coast of Maine. So it's almost certainly a, a northern rain shift. Well, what is the mechanism? What is the prevent winter moth from uh, invading um, the interior where Bruce Stanworm is everywhere? So that's the uh, topic of my PhD student, Hannah Broadley. Who's looking at this? We try to figure out the mechanism. Is it? I mean, eggs. I mean, obviously, it's the egg stage. Uh, are they? Are they? What's kind of the difference between the two species? So Hannah has done a bunch of experiments. She's discovered using the device I'll talk about a little later. She's measured that they both species freeze at about minus 31 degrees C, which is colder than occurred almost everywhere except up up in northern Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, she's deployed eggs of both species. Yeah, the ones in Bruce Spanworm, they don't so they survive much better up in northern New Vermont, Vermont, New Hampshire. But here in Amherst, they both seem to survive. It's uh, maybe a little bit less winter moths. Um, her research suggests that there may be a uh, a phenological effect that exposure to cold temperature in the winter time causes a delay in bud bursts in the spring. It's not just a matter of fewer growing degree days. There's, there's actually a physiological change. Winter moths like Many spring, early spring feeders has to synchronize with bud burst. And the, the, the degree of synchrony with bud burst is critical. And we think that this may, the winter effects may be affecting the ability of winter moths to synchronize with bud burst. But there's more to be told about that, and I'll let Anna finish off that story. So, at any rate, let's see. Um, Hemlock really tells you, this is the last piece I want to talk about. And it's been a major part of my lab research. Many of you probably have this species in your yard. You've seen this, this little white fluffy thing. It's like, a, it's like an it's an aphid-like insect. And underneath one of those little cotton balls is a little insect that is uh, uh, sucking the sap from those hemlock twigs. And it's been a big disaster, an ecological disaster across the eastern United States. It comes from Japan. And this is work by Nathan Howell at the Forest Service, who's shown that we know that the, the uh, this, you know, I think there's 11 species of, of hemlock in the world. Four of them here in the United States, two in the east. All we have one, the eastern hem hemlock, the uh, super canadensis, and that's what's been affected. And our, he, Nathan's work shows that our adelgid comes from Osaka, Japan, which has a very mild uh, maritime climate. It rarely freezes. So the hemlock adelgid is not very well adapted to the cold temperatures we have here in New England. 
and so. So it had, the idolatry was introduced into, into uh, coastal Virginia way back in the early part of the 20th century. For several decades, it just sat there because there's no hemlocks to grow naturally there. It's just backyard trees. And then it was carried over. It was, came in north into New England in the 1970s, uh, probably brought by birds on their feet. The little crawlers uh, emerge uh, at the time the birds are migrating north. So we got it up in, up in New Connecticut sooner than they got it in western, western Virginia. Anyway, the, the green here shows where the hemlocks grow. The brown shows where the, where the adult it is now. But right now, it's, it's re, kind of the northern limit of its range because it does not tolerate the cold winter temperatures. So that's a key part of the ecology that we've been studying in our lab. And there have been several papers showing that, the, in fact, the projected movement of the adelgid is going to go further north uh, where, as the climate warms. So there's a bunch of papers that show that. Um, so the adelgid uh, slowly but surely kills tree. In the southern United States, it's been an ecological disaster. Basically, the hemlock has been eliminated from much of the southern forests because the, the, the trees die rapidly. Here in the north, right, right here in Amherst, um, the adelgid is limping along. So we've had trees right here on campus that have been infested for 20 years. So, you know, the, the, the trees are, don't look good, and slowly they die. And we've lost a lot of trees in the last few years up in the, in the Holyoke Range, and it's just, but it's a slow process, and it's, it's explained by the response to cold temperature. So we undertook a study of this, which is, um, it's a subtle phenomenon. So there's a lot of work that's been done that's showing that, not a, I mean, We've done work that's similar to what uh, Radley showed yesterday from Mount Arizona. If you, if you freeze the adult, the, 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 they, um, they die at a certain temperature. But it changes through the season. So previous work shows that there's north to south differences in, in, in the ability of hemlock uh, to survive cold events. And there are month-to-month -month interests across the winter. So, um, and we did a common garden study uh, in my lab suggesting uh, genetic uh, components to that, those differences, the north to south, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you new data like that. And we use it, in this part of the study, we use instruments, this is, again comes from Matt Ayer's lab um, at Dartmouth. You take an adelgid, which is about the size of the, size of, of the head of a pin, and you, you tape it onto the end of this little finister pro. and do it very carefully so you can get the adelgid. And then you, you, you take, so you can do, you can run 16 of these things all at once, you hook this up to a computer, you, you, you then take the adelgid and you put them into this, this little plastic vial with little BB juice, and then you plunge it into a, a bath of, of, of glycerol in a machine that lowers the temperature. So that's very cool. Uh, this, shows, this shows the machine. You know, you, you set up all these adelgids in there, and you start to run, and the machine drops the temperature, and the semester probes measure the temperature of each adelgid. Whoops. So we... Um, so this shows the data. So we, um, um, we collect the data from north to south. So the adelgid occurs all the way from Georgia down to Georgia and all these different sites. And uh, we put the adelgid into the machine and we lower the temperature. So this graph shows the temperature dropping steadily. And when the adelgid freezes, there's a little blip of heat. So you see these little blips? So that adelgid right there uh, froze at minus 27 degrees. Hang on. Whoops. Um, so you can tell at the exact temperature at which the delta freezes. And see, there's huge variation. So each one of these little blips tells you the temperature. It, it's just quite varied over about 10 degrees. But these are delta from the quab and right here. And look, ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Ah. Ah. Okay, yeah. maybe I'll use the, uh... <laughs> you can see uh, in Kenya, Virginia, they, they freeze at much warmer temperatures than, than uh, at Quabbin. Quabbin, they're all freezing at below 25, and up in Kenya, Virginia, it's minus 20, that's a big difference, north to south difference. These are all adelgids from you know, one branch. There's a huge variation even on one branch, but the differences are profound across the landscape. The adelgids are hardier in the north than they are in the south. So, okay, is that a genetic difference or is it an adaptation difference? So that's why you do a common garden experiment. And that's what we did next. So we took a Delta from these southern locations, we brought them here to the Quabbin, and we inoculated trees from all these different locations. Uh, and then we um, reared them for two generations for a whole year. 
And then we went out and we measured the cold hardiness. At the same time, we collected the doses from the same site in the south uh, and measured them simultaneously in an experiment. That's a common garden experiment. Indeed, there was a difference. I mean, the difference is shown in the slope of the line. So the lines over here on the left are the, 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 the vertical, the horizontal axis is the minimum temperature. So the sites from the south have, uh, uh, um, have higher minimum temperature over on the right. The sites from the north have the lower minimum temperature. So the differences are not very large, uh, but statistically significant. So this shows, and furthermore, the common garden uh, reared insects have identical slopes and patterns to the ones that were collected simultaneously from the same locations. So the difference is, this shows the genetic difference. There's a genetic degree of difference in cold hardiness. And this is how they did. They'll just go into the winter with a, a slight, a small, but statistically significant genetic difference um, to in their cold hardiness. Do it again in February. A very dramatic difference. Look, compare the graph over here on the on the le lower left. This is February 2015. With the graph over on the right, the lower graph from 2016. Um, the ones in the north had had um, much lower cold uh, freezing temperatures. The ones in the north were much more cold hardy in February 2016 than they had been in December, and much more cold hardy in February 2016 than they were in February 2016. So 2015 was different from 2016. This is a big difference. So why, uh, and the difference was, uh, was evident in the, in the north, but not in the south. Could it be due to differences in temperature between the two years? So we did a lab experiment where we collected the deltas from here, right here in the, from the local cemetery and brought them into the lab and we exposed some of them to minus 12, some of them to minus two, and some of them to 10 degrees. And after three days, we found a difference. The ones that have been exposed to colder temperatures uh, uh, at minus 12 degrees were m m more cold hardy than the ones collected from the same location and held at warmer temperatures. What this shows is that these insects are adapting to cold. Expo prior exposure to cold causes them to produce cryoprotectants. So all of these insects, I think it's true of plants too, produce cryoprotectants, that is things like glycerol in their body tissues that protect them from freezing. And that, that, um, that's what allows them to survive cold events. So, in, in this graph, we show the, uh, the differences uh, in the freezing temperatures. The, the black bars show what the freezing temperature of these various uh, adelges in 2000, February 2015. And the, the hash bars over on the right are the freezing points uh, in the following year in February 2016. So we have a big difference in the north, but not in the south. So why the north to south differences in the change in, in the cold hardiness? Well, it has to do with the fact that winter temperatures shown here in, in Amherst were hugely different in the prior period in January 2015 to 2016, whereas winter temperatures in the south, there basically wasn't any difference between the two years. So that difference in temperature, midwinter temperature, produced a big change in cold hardiness in the Indoga. So, then in 2015, we had what we call the, the, the Valentine's Day Massacre. We had a cold event, and maybe some of you remember, temperatures dropped to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Basically, all of the adults died all across New England. From here to the Delaware Water Gap, where we had one of our plots, they were all dead. I mean, we found, and to, to this day, you know, I find many trees are free of the adults. Now, the adults is enormously fecund by many trees, so it bounces back quite quickly. So the adults will recover. There's a, there, you know, there are, but it takes time. So this is why our adults here in the Amherst, our, our hemlocks are still are still with us because it, periodically there are these cold events that blow them away. But what this study shows is that it's all dependent on prior exposure to cold, and that's where global climate change comes in. Because um, the take-home message is that yeah, there's evolution going on. They're evolving cold hardiness as they move north. And many insects adapt to cold by producing cryoprotectants. And this is in response to prior exposure to cold. 
So it is the variability in temperature and not the absolute temperature, cold, the cold temperature of the cold event that kills them. So we, that's, so we might have, we have warming winters that make these insects less adapted to cold, so then when we do have a cold event, it kills them. And so that's the take home message here. Make sense? So, you know, here's this model which suggests that maybe we're having more cold events. Well, clearly the model suggests there's more variability. You have warming winter events, and then you have cold events. Um, and maybe we have fewer cold events, but it's the contrast between them that kills these insects. So, um, we had a lot of events like this in, at the time of bud burst, and maybe you've seen some of this. I, this is, uh, we've had several years, 2012, 2016, I believe, we had very warm winters, just like I described. And then at the time of bud burst, we had a big freeze, minus 20 Fahrenheit, not minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, now enough to freeze everything. And uh, there was a huge effect across the landscape on flowering plants. My forsythia didn't flower in 2016. My magnolia tree died completely. Um, my, all the local orchardists lost their, their, their fruit crops. I mean, the ramifications of these events are large. I mean, I would argue, I mean, many years ago, I used to work on gypsy moth mites and acorns. I would argue that there's a big freeze in 2012, which killed the uh, um, uh, many species. It, it killed the orchard crops in my area. Oh, I noticed the following year there were fewer squirrels. Almost surely it killed the acorn crop. Fewer squirrels means fewer mice. And gypsy moths jump from being non-existent to suddenly I've seen that following year. Gypsy moths. There's no defoliation, but it sets the stage for the dramatic gypsy moth defoliation that we had here. Now, I don't have no data to prove that, but this is the kind of thing that I think about. I mean, these are events. These, these cold events have multiple ramifications that affect many of our species, and of course, they're all being influenced by climate change. That's my story.